kind-hearted young woman, beloved by friends and family. Samantha always had a smile on her face. She loved people, and people loved her, and she loved her cats. Found bludgeoned and strangled in her own home. I noticed the uh, cable wrapped around her neck three or four times. Military people use it not fairly often. It was a square knot. Police explore whether her search for love took a deadly turn. He wanted to come over and see her, told her to be blindfolded, topless. She told me he parked in her driveway and just sat there. It fit that mode of being a stalker. Until a shocking discovery. We found that he was more than just a friend. That in fact he'd been a lover. Reveals a killer no one saw coming. He was a very unlikely killer. He didn't fit the profile at all. I was in shock. Frankly, I've never seen anything quite like this before. Wichita Falls, Texas, a former oil boom town that grew into a small city. Wichita Falls is a town of about 100,000 people, about 130 miles west of Dallas. It's quiet community. We're very uh, close-knit community. It does have a small town feel to it. It's not difficult to get to know just about everybody in town. But the town's sense of security is shattered on the morning of January 6, 2003, when police get a call from a woman who says she's just discovered her friend's lifeless body in the bedroom of her home. I was a rookie police officer, and we got this call. They somebody found a body, and we rushed over to the scene. When we arrived, I remember seeing her friends, and they were very upset. The frantic couple tell the officer the deceased woman is 28-year-old Samantha Lazar. At this time, I still don't know what exactly is going on. I arrived 30 seconds to a minute after the first officer arrived. So uh, when he entered the uh, residence, I was right behind him. So with weapons draw, and we're clearing the bottom of the house, the kitchen. We start going up the stairs, and we got down the hallway to her bedroom. That's when I realized we have a murder. The victim was kind of in a prone position. I noticed the pool of blood was around her head, and I noticed the uh, cable wrapped around her neck uh, three or four times. I'd never seen it get to you. We had proceeded to establish a crime scene. A few minutes later, detectives and forensics arrived. The victim had a ligature made of uh, coaxial cable tied very tight around her throat it was a square knot there's a couple of places you learn knots like that military people probably use that knot fairly often and so it told me that whoever killed samantha was versed in the knot based on some training the cable was not the only weapon used by the killer there was a fire extinguisher a few feet away from her that had hair and blood on it there was definitely blood at the back of her head a lot of it There were some handprint, rich detail on the fire extinguisher that appeared to be in blood. It looked like there was some fingerprint detail even on the coax. A strangulation death has some up close and, and personal aspect to it. Based on what we saw, we thought there was a good chance the killer actually knew the victim. Detectives examined the rest of the room for any other clues. In the middle of the bed was a laser pointer. On top of the laser pointer was some blood spatter. So we figured that the pointer had to have been on the bed when the injuries occurred to the victim. And looking around the house in general, none of the windows were broken and all the doors were intact. Whenever you don't have forcible entry, your first thought is that it's someone that she knows. Police immediately began the process of interviewing Samantha's neighbors. One of the neighbors had written down that a car with California tags was at Samantha's home on about January the 1st. The car from California had been seen five days prior, but a different neighbor noticed another suspicious vehicle less than 24 hours before Samantha was found dead. There was a 12-year-old young man who noticed a motorcycle at Samantha's home. He said it was red and black, and so uh, information about the motorcycle was noted. 
soon, news of the murder reaches Samantha's loved ones. I just barely got to work when my husband calls and he tells me to come home. And uh, he said that someone had killed Samantha the night before. That went into instant shock. That's just not something you can comprehend. I mean, is this really happening? I got a phone call from a friend and he told me to turn the news on. And her house was on the news with police tape all around it. I went numb. I fell to the ground. Samantha Lazark grew up in the small town of Terrell, Texas, and was the oldest of three children. Samantha had two brothers, Joe Jr. and Lance, who was the baby. And Samantha practically raised him when I could work. She was very responsible. She could cook, she could wash clothes, and she loved little kids, and she loved elderly people. She was one of them late bloomers. She didn't really care that much about boys until she met John. Samantha married her high school sweetheart, John Lazark, at age 20. John, he went to school to be a refrigerator repairman. And Samantha worked at the grocery store, and her job was real important to her. I met her when I worked at Albertson. And Samantha was everyone's favorite cashier. And you may be having a bad day, and she just make you happy. She was very um, high spirited. She loved her cats. She loved music, and she just loved her tattoos. Everything she had had a meaning. She had her fairies on both arms. Then she had one on her chest right here that was for John. It said, "Always in my heart." A devoted wife, Samantha was blindsided when after eight years of marriage, John left her for another woman. She just kept crying to make him happy, and she was so devastated when he left. Samantha picked herself up, and several months later, she began dating again. Samantha's confidence definitely changed. I think Samantha was just trying to have fun, get out back into the world, try new things. Who killed this vibrant and kind young woman, and why? To try to answer these questions, police interview the couple who found the body, Lori and Donnie Nieves. With Lori and Donnie, as they were the last ones in the home before the police arrived, we certainly needed to make sure that there was no information that would tie either one of them to the actual murder. Detectives start with Lori, who says she and Samantha were co-workers. Lori described herself as being a good friend of Samantha's, and she said Samantha didn't come to work, which was very unusual. She didn't answer the phone. Donnie had taken Lori to work that morning, and so he came back to get her and take her to Samantha's home to check on her. Lori said they knocked on the door and didn't get an answer, but the door was unlocked. And so they went in and looked around, and they went upstairs and found Samantha deceased. Investigators speak to Donnie next, and he confirms Lori's statement. Donnie characterized Samantha as being his wife's friend. He said that he was only there because he gave his wife a ride to go check on the... Lori pointed her finger at Samantha's estranged husband, John Lazard. Lori said that John was upset with Samantha because she was about to end his health insurance coverage that she'd been paying for, and he had an injury that was going to be very expensive if he didn't have insurance. Investigators learned that this ongoing conflict had recently escalated. Lori said Samantha told her in a couple of weeks before the murder. Samantha and John argued about the health insurance, and John told her something to the effect of, I want to take everything you have away from you. And so that threat certainly raised a red flag for us and made us wonder if John Lazark had anything to do with this murder. Coming up, police unearth a hidden online world. Samantha signed up for one of the chat rooms. Her username was meowmix28. The information on the chat was pretty sexual in nature. I warned her plenty of times watching her giving her address out to... And hunt a bold killer with sinister motives. The fact that he couldn't take no for an answer made us want to figure out exactly who he was. He pressured her to meet in person. And she said, what if you're a serial killer? There's only one person that could put the DNA and the fingerprints on the murder weapon. Until investigators close in on an unlikely suspect. 
they look like a decent, clean-cut, all-American kid. One of the most evil human beings. I was seriously afraid that there would be another victim. Police are investigating the violent murder of 28-year-old Samantha Lazar. Detectives have learned that Samantha and her estranged husband, John, were in a bitter dispute. She had threatened to take him off her health insurance policy, and Samantha's friend said he didn't make a threat at one point. That made us want to know more about John and the relationship with Samantha. Investigators learned the marriage had only ended six months prior. They asked those close to Samantha about what led to the breakup. Her best friend was going through a divorce, and Samantha, being the kind-hearted person she was, let her move in. Samantha noticed that her friend and John seemed to be a lot closer, perhaps, than what she was comfortable with. Finally, she asked them if they were having an affair, and they said, yeah, they were in love. I remember how upset she was. I mean, how else could you feel when your husband leaves you for your best friend? John moved out with his girlfriend, but remained in Samantha's life. They were separated, but John would move back in with Samantha. When he kept moving in and out, it was hell. For good, so she could get on with her life. But John was still dependent on her health insurance. John, when he was 18, a car fell on him when he was working underneath it and messed up his back. He was really anxious about the insurance. Investigators bring John in to the station. In the interview with John Lazark, he said that he and Samantha had sorted out the insurance and that she was not going to terminate his health care coverage. John also denies that he threatened Samantha like her friend claimed. But as he talks, detectives notice a suspicious detail. He had some small injuries to his hands that we wanted to talk to him about. John explained that they cut his hands while moving a table. The night of the murder, John said that he was with his girlfriend and that she, in fact, confirmed his alibi. If I were in love with somebody and they killed somebody else, I may lie for them, but there wasn't anything to contradict what he said. We asked John for fingerprints and a, a sample of his DNA, and he agreed to do that. Police have nothing concrete to tie John to the murder. But before they let him go, detectives ask who he thinks might want Samantha dead. John Lazark told us that his strange wife was uh, online dating. John said he told her it was risky. He might have run into some dangerous people. Investigators set out to verify John's claim. We interviewed Samantha's friend, Lisa, and Lisa told us that she knew that Samantha was in fact online dating. Samantha told me one day that she signed up for one of the chat rooms. It was so new back then. She just made a username and started meeting guys. Her username was MeowMix28. It was her love of cats, and she was 28 years old. When she started meeting these guys online, I said, you don't know these people. You're not letting them come to the house, are you? And I could tell that she didn't want me to know because she knew it was going to upset me really bad. The computer forensics lab examined Samantha's conversations with people online, making arrangements to meet people that, they, that she'd uh, chatted with online. Investigators compare the messages with details of Samantha's dating life provided by her friends. Police have told us that Samantha was dating a man named Chris, and she'd spoken with Samantha the evening of the murder, in fact, and that Chris was at Samantha's home visiting with her. I did not know Chris. I'd never met him. I know she really liked him and liked hanging out with him. She said Chris was over at her house that evening when she called me. I had bought her the latest season of Friends. It was out on DVD, and she said, we're going to watch Friends. I'll call you tomorrow. And that the call with Lisa around 6 p.m. was the last contact anyone had with Samantha. She was found dead the following morning, just before 10 a.m. Because Chris was with Samantha shortly before she died, we really wanted to look at uh, to see who Chris was and where he was. Investigators search for Chris in Samantha's online chats. However, they find her most recent correspondence, only two days before the murder, is with a man who goes by the username I am Elliot. 
I am Elliot said that he had recently lost his wife, and Samantha said, well, I've recently lost my husband to my best friend. I am Elliot being very sympathetic to her in their, in their messages, and she seemed to respond to that. We weren't sure who I am Elliot was. Her conversations with I am Elliot had seemed pretty innocent, and there was no association with the name Chris. Investigation went and moved on from there. Detectives dig deeper into Samantha's chats, looking for messages with a darker tone. So the forensic lab was able to retrieve a chat with somebody initial KS, and the information on the chat was pretty sexual in nature. This individual pressured her to meet in person almost immediately, and so that raised red flags about him. He wanted to come over and see her, told her to be blindfolded, topless, and ironically she said, what if you're a serial killer? But in the end she went along with it. Detective suspicion only grows when they realize that chat between KS and Samantha is dated January 1st, just five days before the murder. One well, of the neighborhood watch people had seen a Mercedes with California license plates on it that had been at her house January 1st. It had all of the signs that we were on the right track with this guy. So we ran the license plate number and the tag came back to Christoph Slora. Could Christoph Slora, KS, be the Chris who was with Samantha just hours before she was found dead? Samantha's best friend said that the night she was killed, she was with somebody named Chris. So we said, hey, maybe this is the Chris that we're looking for. Three days after the murder of Samantha Lazark, police have linked her online chat to the owner of a car with California plates seen parked at her house just days before she was killed. The neighbor had written down the license plate number of a Christoph Flora's car. Police believe that Christoph is the man behind the username KS. When we looked at the online chat between KS and Samantha, we were really interested in finding that person. Samantha did tell her friend that she was hanging out with a guy named Chris the night of her murder. Alarm bells ring when they dig deeper into their suspect's background. Christoph was stationed at Shepherd Air Force Base here in Wichita Falls. Christoph wound up being somebody that was in the military. There was a perfect square knot in the ligature that killed Samantha, and I've already thought that somebody, perhaps with a military background, knew that square knot. While officers are sent to bring Christoph into the PD, detectives receive Samantha's autopsy report. The cause of death was strangulation and that the coax was the, the mains. The report also shows significant blunt force trauma to the back of Samantha's head. I think it would be really hard to just strangle somebody with a cable, and I suspect that the fire extinguisher was used to incapacitate Samantha so that she couldn't fight back. There was no evidence found during the autopsy or any other testing that showed there was any kind of sign of a sexual assault. Forensic analysis of the murder weapons gives investigators hope that the killer will be identified. From the lab, we learned that the coax had, and that the fire extinguisher also had DNA from who we believe would be the killer. The evidence that came back from the lab was very powerful. Fingerprints were on both the weapons, so it was pretty clear that if we could find one person that matched all these pieces of evidence, that we had the person that committed this crime, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt. Armed with new insights into the murder, police head to the local Air Force base to look for their number one suspect. When we tracked down Chris Loro, we asked him if he would come in for an interview, and he agreed to do that. He admitted that he had had a sexual relationship with some but they didn't have a lot else in common, and he said he hadn't seen her for some time. Investigators ask him to explain why witnesses saw his car outside Samantha's home on January 1st, just five days before she was killed. At that point, he did not have anything to do with her death or being over there the day of the murder. Police want to know where Chris was the night Samantha was killed. Chris Laura said that he spent the day with some friends at a batting cage and all up the names of his friends. We followed up that information by interviewing his friends and they assured us, in fact, 
Chris Laura had been with them during the day and into the evening that day. Detectives conclude that Chris Laura was not the Chris that Samantha was with when she called her friend at 6 p.m. But they can't rule him out as the perpetrator, since the exact time of her death is unknown. Prince and DNA sample for us. With no hard evidence against Chris Laura, he's free to go. Four days after her murder, family and friends gather to lay Samantha to rest. Samantha's funeral, it was packed. It was full of people that loved her. It was beautiful. She had a really big funeral. It was just hard. Nobody should have to bury their child. And the, the way she died was so violent. And I couldn't stand the thought of what actually happened to her. I had to take all of her pictures down for a while. I just couldn't deal with it. The next day, detectives ask Samantha's friends if they know of any other men she may have been involved with and receive stunning new information. Lisa raised the name Donnie Davis to somebody that she thought that had an affair with Samantha. Lori and Donnie Davis were the last ones in the home before the police arrived. They found Samantha deceased. I was surprised because when we interviewed Donnie at the time, Donnie characterized his relationship with Samantha as being his wife's friend. But after the funeral, Samantha's friend Lisa said that Donnie was more than just a friend, that in fact he'd been a lover. Lori was a good friend of Samantha's and also a co-worker. But Samantha told me that Donnie and her had a short, intimate relationship shortly before she was killed. Samantha definitely felt guilty about it. Once we realized that he had been a lover of Samantha's, we had to look at him more closely. They had not been forthcoming before about this affair, so it makes you suspicious that this person has something to hide, and maybe what they have to hide is they're involved in the crime. That is a red flag. It's been one week since 28-year-old Samantha Lazark was found bludgeoned and strangled to death in her home. Now, investigators have learned that Samantha had an affair with the man who discovered her body. When Donnie Nieves was first interviewed, he failed to mention that he had been intimate with Samantha. When we interviewed Donnie again and confronted him with the question, were you lovers with a victim, he admitted that he was and that it had been a very brief, intense relationship. Detectives asked Donnie why he didn't tell them about the relationship before. He said he didn't want his wife to find out about this affair because he knew she wouldn't be happy about it. Had Donnie killed some... Digging in here and see if there's anything that would connect him to the murder. Donnie insists he did not kill Samantha and begs investigators not to tell his wife about his infidelity. We asked him if he'd give DNA and fingerprints and he cooperated. Police let Donnie go. And while they wait for his DNA and fingerprint results, investigators uncover another suspicious exchange with an online suitor in Samantha's chat room history. His username was Death Metal. Samantha formed a relationship with Death Metal based on their mutual enjoyment of that kind of music. The messages suggest the pair had been on several dates, but then something changed. From the correspondence, he thought that was a pretty good relationship. And then all of a sudden, without warning, she's told him she wanted to break it off. The relationship may have been over, but the man continued to send Samantha messages. The fact that Death Metal couldn't take no for an answer certainly made us want to look at him pretty close and figure out exactly who he was and interview him. Had the man been so enraged by the rejection that he murdered Samantha? Police ask Samantha's friend Lisa if she can help identify death metal. Samantha's friend Lisa said it was a guy by the name of Connor Days. Connor was the one that really got to her, made her nervous. I warned her plenty of times, like meeting people online, you know, watch your back, watch who you're giving your address out to, your phone number. And uh, he was the only one that really stands out in my mind that he, he scared her. He just wouldn't stay away. He left notes on her door. 
even though Samantha told Connor that she didn't want to have anything to do with him any longer, and they kind of freaked her out a little bit. Samantha told me one day he parked in her driveway and just sat there, and she'd call me, and she wouldn't know what to do. Connor would fit that mode of being a stalker, coming around to the lady's house all times of the day or night, and that stalker profile is the one that can lead to someone being a murderer. Connor looked really good for this, only he wasn't a Chris. But Samantha had dated him shortly before the murder, and we certainly knew that we had to find him. Investigators track down Connor and bring him in for questioning. When we interviewed Connor Days, he was pretty nonchalant about the whole thing. He didn't seem to have a, a lot of interest in the fact that she was dead. And that was either a, I absolutely didn't do this, or yeah, I'm trying to throw you off, and we weren't sure which one it was. Police asked Connor why he wouldn't leave Samantha alone after she broke off the relationship. Connor admitted he kept coming back around even though she didn't want to see him any longer. And it wasn't until she pressed the whereabouts at the time of the murder. Connor said that he was home alone and he didn't have anyone else to substantiate that claim. And that's a problem. Connor was asked during the interview to provide a sample of his DNA and prints for us. With no hard evidence linking Connor to the murder, he is released. Three weeks have passed since Samantha was found dead, and investigators still haven't found the elusive Chris that was with Samantha the evening she was killed. There had been an awful lot of work done, and we still hadn't uh, solved the case. It was kind of a frustrated feeling that uh, the person hadn't been caught yet. As they await news and arrest, those closest to Samantha struggle with the pain of losing her. The mental images, imagining her maybe crying out for her mom or her dad or even me, or somebody to come help her. It just makes me sick knowing someone could do that. Like one of the most evil human beings. I couldn't grasp the thought that my daughter was gone and she wasn't coming back. One month into the investigation, police are running out of leads. But then they receive the forensic results they hope will blow the case wide open. When you get information about whose prints or whose DNA is on that coaxial cord that was around the throat, that's just the place where you work to be. There's only one person that could put the DNA and the fingerprints on the murder weapon, and that was the killer. It's been one month since Samantha Lazark was killed, and detectives have just received lab results from evidence found on the murder weapons. We had all these suspects and were able to obtain possession of DNA samples and fingerprints. Will the results match John Lazark, Samantha's estranged husband, Donnie Nieves, who had an affair with Samantha and also found her body, or one of her online suitors, Connor Days or Christoph Slora? It did seem like we were on the brink of solving the case, but the results came back, and it did exonerate all these people Investigators are stunned. The DNA and fingerprints don't belong to any of their suspects, or even anyone in the police database. We're hoping for a match, and it's a little disheartening when you think maybe you've got something, and then it turns out not to be at all. I talked to the DA and uh, the lead detective, but I didn't know was never going to get the justice that she deserved. With the investigation back to square one, Police review all the evidence and statements they've collected so far in their hunt for Samantha's killer. While we were looking back through the notes, we remembered that there was a youngster in the neighborhood that said something about a motorcycle having been around the night that Samantha died. So we asked the computer forensics people to look for the keyword motorcycle. And they came back with information that, in fact, I am Elliot. He said that he had a motorcycle. When detectives previously looked at chats between Samantha and I am Elliot, they didn't find any red flags in the correspondence or any indication his name was Chris, so they moved on to other leads. 
her conversations with IML, it had seemed pretty innocent. And during the correspondence, he told her he worked out a Metro Photo. Metro Photo was a camera shop in Wichita Falls. Investigators rushed to the store, hoping to locate their new suspect. The 12 year old said the motorcycle was red and black. And we went by the camera shop, and there was a red and black Harley Davidson motorcycle. It was a, an aha moment, if you will. We ran the plates on the motorcycle. We found out it didn't belong to a person named Christopher Kyle Russell. The tag came back to Chris Russell. And we said, ah, oh, Chris, aha. It made it even a bigger aha moment for us. And uh, that's when we decided it was time to know more about Chris. And Chris Russell was enrolled at Western State University here in Wichita Falls, taking uh, some criminal justice classes. He looked like he came from a good home. And he was a decent, clean-cut, all-American kid. His family was well-to-do, respected members of a large church here in town. His profile was almost too good to be true. Our first interview with Chris was a trip to Metro Photo, where we went in and asked him to come with us, and he did. At the station, investigators begin by asking the 21-year-old if he was with Samantha on the night of her murder. He was polite, but he declined to give an interview. He was asked to give his uh, DNA samples and fingerprints, and he said he needed to talk to a lawyer before he did anything. Even though it's Chris's right to tell us no, maybe it's because he had something he didn't want us to know. So we served Chris the search warrant in order to obtain prints and DNA from him. As detectives wait for results, they continue to look into Chris Russell's past and discover he served in the armed forces. Chris had, in fact, been in the Marine Corps, but only for a matter of days. They sent him packing after they... With Chris looking increasingly suspicious, what detectives discover next is chilling. In the chat between Chris and Samantha, he said that he had recently lost his wife, and he looked into this and found some, frankly, rather terrifying information. Investigators learn that Chris lived in the small town of Shadron, Nebraska, with his wife Tara, who died only 10 weeks before Samantha's murder. It was a short time after she had passed away. One night he packed up his belongings and moved back to Wichita Falls from Shadron. Police contact law enforcement in Nebraska for information about the death of their suspect's wife. Chris Russell's wife died under circumstances that at first uh, was ruled pneumonia. However, when the autopsy came back and there was noted some bruising on the neck, that tells me that it probably wasn't pneumonia. That sounds to me like a strangulation. But by the time the autopsy information was released, Chris had already had his wife cremated and left the state. I think the original autopsy didn't go into enough detail for authorities to charge Chris with that murder, and now that she had been cremated, that was never going to happen. Police fear they have an emerging serial killer on their hands. Detectives obtain a search warrant for Chris's residence. Chris lived with his parents here in Wichita Falls. While we were executing the search warrant, we noticed in Chris's bedroom a photograph that we thought was Samantha. But that was his deceased wife, Tara. Chris Russell's wife died, and weeks later, Samantha's now dead, and she looks incredibly like Chris Russell's wife. Police uncover more disturbing clues in Chris Russell's bedroom. We found a book, and it was a book about knots. And had I not known that there was a square knot around Samantha's neck, it probably wouldn't have looked twice at that book. And we also found some laser pointers. The laser pointers found in Chris's bedroom were nearly identical to the one found at the crime scene. There wasn't actually a smoking gun found during that search warrant, but there were certainly bullets to load that gun with. Investigators seized Chris's computer and confirmed that he's the man behind the username, I am Elliot. But as they start reviewing his chat logs, police discover another troubling detail. We found that Chris, not only was he seeing Samantha, but he was seeing another young lady in Wichita Falls as well. Fearing that their killer could strike again, police rush to track the woman down. I was terrified about her. I was seriously afraid that she would be another victim in
police investigating the murder of Samantha Lazark have learned that their prime suspect's wife died under suspicious circumstances and believe that his new girlfriend is in grave danger. I was worried he would do something else again. This nice young lady has no idea what she's involved with. We were certainly worried that she might be another victim in this case. Detectives locate the woman and inform her that Chris is under investigation. She was surprised to, to find that Chris perhaps was involved with a murder here in Wichita Falls. When we interviewed her, she said that Chris had brought her a DVD of friends to her home and that it was opened when, uh, when she got it. Investigators believe it's the same DVD Chris had watched with Samantha on the night of her murder. Samantha told her friend Lisa that she and Chris had watched that DVD of friends at her home. But when we searched the, the crime scene at Samantha's house, the friend's DVD was not there. With the evidence against Chris growing, police receive his DNA and fingerprint results. In the end, there was only one person with DNA and fingerprints on the murder weapon. And that would be who killed Samantha. And that was Chris Russell. We arrested him at work. As I recall, he didn't seem surprised we were there at all. In fact, he didn't have anything to say about it. At trial, prosecutors put forward their theory about how the murder unfolded. The day of the murder, they were having a nice Sunday afternoon together and went out to her house and her friend Lisa talked to her on the phone and things were still going good when he was there, evidently. Maybe Chris brought her a laser pointer so that she could play with her cats. Then something happened that caused him to be angry. First thing was a surprise attack from behind because the bruises were all on the back of her head. It knocked her to the floor. At that point, the coaxial cable was in connection with the television set, and he had evidently ripped it out, which indicated a person who was very angry. And she's desperately trying to fight him off. At the same time, he starts looping that coaxial cable around her throat once, twice, and then a third time. And then he ties the knot there. And all the time she's getting weaker as blood is flowing out of her body. Then he strangles the life out of her. With no confession from Chris, no one knows his motive for murdering Samantha. You'd always like to know exactly what happened at the Lazark home that night, but something caused him to decide guilty. And the judge gives him the maximum sentence of 99 years in prison. There was an overwhelming sense of relief that we had taken somebody from society and put them someplace where they weren't going to harm anybody. And that's that big, deep sigh you get when you know in your heart that you did a good job. When you look at Chris Russell at first glance, you see a nice, clean-cut young man who was going to college to better himself and who was a regular churchgoer. He was a very unlikely killer. He didn't fit the profile at all. I guess what we should take away from a case like this is that we need to take caution. When we meet people online, you can't be too careful. An investigation is later opened into the death of Chris Russell's wife, but no charges have been laid. For Samantha's family and friends, the pain of losing her will never go away. I want my daughter back, which I know it's, you know, not ever going to happen. She was special. She really was. She loved everybody. And she loved her mama the best. But I just... I don't know what to say. I don't know. We can't get her back. That day, Chris took my best friend, an amazing person, a person that can never be replaced in your life. I know she's watching down on me. I know she tries to protect me. Samantha inspired me to definitely not take things for granted and to just live each day, make it the best I can. She's just made me a better person.